All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I hope you all had a great break. I, uh, man, I feel nervous today. I got like butterflies in my tummy about this class. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know. It's just the first day of classes back, I guess. Welcome to software engineering. Uh, welcome to Comp 3350. Um, today we're going to, uh, you know, spend a little bit of time taking a look at what this course is, the expectations that we're going to have for you throughout the term. You're going to be spending, we're going to be spending a little bit of time talking about software development methodologies. So you've been spending a lot of time in your classes up until this point learning about how to write code. There's a lot of time that you're spending on how to write code in various program in various courses before this one. When you get out into the real world, when you get out of school, when you get out of academia, there are ways that people and teams go about building software. It's not just heads down, fingers on keyboards and go for it. There's a lot that goes into software development that kind of goes outside of just doing programming. We're going to spend some time today looking at a couple of ways that people approach doing software development in industry. And since this is a team based course, you're going to be spending some time getting to know your, your team today. Uh, the teams are assigned randomly and I'll tell you a little bit more about this again a little bit later, but uh, the teams aren't quite finalized yet. There's still opportunity for people to drop the course uh, in the revision period. So the people that are on your team right now might not be the people that are on your team throughout the, the rest of the term. So just keep that in mind. So uh, first things first, who am I? Uh, my name is Franklin. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to meet all of you. That's, that's me when I'm not wearing this. Uh, so you have a better sense of what the lower half of my face looks like. The top half of my head is pretty much the same as it is there. My office this term and has been for quite a while is in uh, E2418. So that's just up one floor and I'm right at the end of the hallway that has all of the, uh, the prof and instructor offices um, that kind of runs parallel to this, uh, to this hallway. My office hours this term are on Mondays and Wednesdays from 1030 to 12 p.m. Uh, but you can also make an appointment if those times don't work for you. I try to leave my door open as often as possible just to make sure that everybody feels welcome coming into my office. If my door is open, that means that I'm happy to see you and you can just kind of pop in and see me. If you want to guarantee that I'm going to be in my office, either show up during my office hours or, or send me an email in advance and I'll, I'll be happy to make an appointment to, uh, to meet with you at a specific time. If you need to email me for any reason this term, uh, that is my email address. So franklin.bristow at umanitoba.ca. As with all courses that you've taken, I want you to adhere to the U of M's communication policy and send emails to me from your My U Manitoba email address. I'm usually pretty polite if you accidentally send it to me from like Gmail or something and I just reply and ask you politely to send it to me from your U of M, uh, from your U of M email address. That's me. Uh, now I want to spend some time talking about uh, the course itself. So as with basically every course that you've ever taken, the course homepage is on UM Learn. This is what it looks like right now. There are two sections of this course. So there's an A01 and an A02. And I immediately forget as I'm saying that which one we actually are. But all course material is found under this content. And I have helpfully put for myself A02. We are A02. We're section A02. Everything that you need for this course can be found here. You might have noticed uh, before I started the class that I'm recording this lecture. I'm going to record all of my lectures. And you can find the lectures uploaded to UMLearn after class uh, in this area here. Every week, we are going to be covering a different topic. And I, I just want to quickly take a look at this ROAS and course schedule. 
um, to, to give you a sense of what to expect upcoming throughout the term. Uh, so every week throughout the course, we're going to be looking at different um, topics about software engineering and software development. There are going to be some required readings throughout this course. I'm going to ask you to do some preparation before you come to class. A lot of the class time is going to be spent working on things related to your project with your team. So I want you to do some prep before you come to class in most classes so that when you do get to class, we can just start working on stuff immediately without having to spend a lot of time with me standing at the front of the room shouting at you and having you all uh, you know, sit and quietly listen to me. I'd like us to spend more time actually doing work on the, the project uh, through activities and stuff throughout the term. Uh, in terms of the final grading and the way that the course is assessed, I'm just going to quickly skip past everything here. There's a lot here. The major deliverable that you have in this course is a team-based project. That team-based project is worth 55% of your final grade. There are going to be two term tests in this course, and each term test is worth 20%. The term tests have been scheduled. They are scheduled in the, uh, in the weeks here. So you can see that our second term, task, term test is in class on March 28th. So getting pretty close to the end of classes. And the last part of your uh, grade breakdown for this course is there's one individual assignment. So everybody's going to have to work on an assignment that's going to be released closer to the end of the course. Uh, but it's going to be a smaller assignment um, looking at working with projects that are already out there and existing and are big projects and how you would apply and make changes to those projects. The final grading scheme is here. So A plus is 93% or higher. And then I, I don't want to read all that to you. You can kind of take a look at this a little bit later um, on your own time. The Course deliverables for this course, the big thing is going to be a project. This is the major deliverable that you're going to have uh, throughout this course. The way that we do our projects in this course is that you're going to be working on the same project throughout the entire term. We're going to be starting this week and next week looking at non-technical planning artifacts. And that's going to be one of the first things that your teams are submitting for this project. So planning out some stuff before you actually dive into programming. Then we'll start actually doing some, some programming. And we're going to be building on the expectations that we have for the project for each time that you make a submission for this project. So we're going to be changing how, uh, how, how we're expecting you to do things like testing on the project each time you make a new uh, delivery for the project. The due dates for each of these units of work, these are called iterations, and we'll, we'll talk more about that later, are in the course schedule. So if you look up in this course schedule, you can see when all of these things are due uh, throughout the term. The way that you're going to be submitting all this work is uh, using Git. We're going to be using a version control system. We're going to be using GitLab, which is hosted locally on the U of M campus. And the way that we're going to be assessing your assignments is uh, your projects is basically whatever you have committed and pushed before the due date is, uh, is made, um, is, is set. Each team is going to be assessed on the project. So you as a team, as a unit team, will get a grade for each part of the project. But every individual student in this course is going to possibly get a different grade than what the team gets. So every time you submit something as part of a team, you're going to have the opportunity to assess your peers. So how much time they put into the, to the work, how much work they put into it, the quality of the work that they're submitting. You're going to have an opportunity to tell me about what kind of work your peers have been doing on your project. And this is going to be used to scale the grade that your team has been assigned. 
basically, I don't, I don't want to punish a team just because there's somebody that maybe wasn't able to pull as much weight as they should have been able to throughout the term. Ideally, everybody's going to be able to put in the same amount of time and effort throughout the course, but realistically, this is just, you know, I want to make sure that it's fair for, for everybody. The assignment is going to be due on the, uh, the last day of classes, and we'll provide a lot more information about that much later in the course. And the term tests are going to be um, through uh, scheduled throughout the course. Yeah, okay. Are there any questions about the course uh, deliverables? I mean, there's lots of questions I'm sure you have about the project, but we'll kind of get into that a little bit later. But anything else about the course so far? Okay, cool. So, you've all signed up for software engineering. The main answer to why are we here is this is a course that's required for graduation. So you kind of have to be here at some point if you want to get a degree in computer science from the U of M. But, I mean, you know, with most courses here, with all courses here, with all courses here, we want to make sure that you're actually getting something out of, out of the course that you're taking. So why are you taking this course? The goals that we have for you for this course are to do things like compare agile and rigorous software development. This is gonna be the major topic that we're thinking about this week. So different types of software development methodologies. I'm going to verbally describe to you what rigorous software development is. And throughout the term, you are going to experience an agile software development process. So we want you to be able to compare at least broadly, these two major types, these two major approaches to how we go about developing software as a group or as a team. We want you to be able to integrate testing with implementation to ensure thorough test coverage. In Comp 2160, in Comp 2160, maybe in Comp 1020, but definitely in Comp 2160, you were introduced to this idea of automated testing. That was probably pretty painful when you did it because you were writing it in C, but you were introduced to this idea of writing code that runs other code and checking the output of that code to make sure that it's correct. Chances are pretty high that that was the last thing you did in that assignment that you had for that course. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. I, I mean, I don't want to project on anybody, but I'm guessing that that was probably one of the last things that you did for that assignment that you had to do testing in. I want you to go through the process of building software and make testing a core part of what you're doing. I want you to go through the process of building software and implementing software and actually measuring the kinds of testing that you're doing. How much testing are you doing and how effective is that testing? I want you to, to be able to develop software to evolving requirements. You, as teams, are going to come up with your own projects. You're gonna come up with your own projects. You're gonna plan out some ideas of what you want to do. You're gonna have big ideas and you're gonna have big plans for what you want to do. And you're really quickly gonna find out that you planned way too much, that you are thinking way too big and it's not possible for you to do that. As the course is going on, you're going to have to spend time changing what it is that you're actually building. As the course is going on, I am going to change expectations for what you have to do for each of these iterations, each of these deliverables that you're making. So throughout the term, the requirements that you have for building this software are going to change. And this is realistic. This is what you might expect to have in a workplace where you're building software for a client you build something, they say, hey, that looks great, except this. And now you have to change it. 
or you build something and you realize that it's actually impossible to build that thing. So you have to change what it is that you're building. The things that we're trying to build in software development change and that's okay. So we want to be able to make sure that we can actually do that. I want you to be able to refine software as it's being developed. Requirements are coming from external places. I've got a user that's telling me this is what I want this thing to do. Now I want it to do something else and you've got to change what you're building. As you are building your own software, as you are writing code, you can realize that the software that you're making is really fragile. It's hard to make it so that it does other stuff. I want you to be able to take code software and build it so that it is easy to change and then identify when it's not easy to change and transform it into something that's easy to change. And I want you to be able to maintain an existing software system. This is going to be kind of about the last, one of the last topics that we look at is taking a look at how do we get existing software that's built that we didn't build in the first place and how do we make changes to that software safely so that, uh, so that it can be delivered to our clients. I want you to be able to develop code in a team and share code safely among your members. So we're going to be building everything in a team this term, and we're going to be using version control software. I want you to be able to use an agile approach to facilitate incremental development. So like I said, we're starting with planning this week, non-technical stuff, and then we're actually going to be moving on to building and building and building uh, throughout the term. And finally, and this is definitely the last one, finally, this is... Uh, as part of a team, design and build a complete software product to solve a real world problem. So as a, as a group, you're going to come up with, this is the thing that we want to build. You're going to go through the process of planning it. You're going to go through the process of designing it. And you're going to go through the process of implementing it and then delivering something to me, to me. Before we go too much further into core stuff, uh, I just want to try and set some expectations for you um, just in terms of illnesses and, and, and pol masking policy at the U of M. I'm going to really politely ask you all to wear a mask. This is a U of M policy. If you don't have a mask, I have masks and I can provide them to you. The U of M is choosing to maintain the masking policy, so please respect that policy. Please respect me. Please respect your peers when you come to class and, uh, and wear a mask. Please don't come to class if you're sick. There's a lot of people in this class, and you're sitting pretty close to each other. You're sitting, you know, packed in like sardines is uh, the best analogy that I can come up with here. If you are sick, please don't come. I know that you're working on a team and I know that it feels terrible and it feels like you are not participating with your team when you aren't able to come to class. But your team will understand. I guarantee that your team will understand if you are sick and you can't make it to class. If I am sick, so for full transparency, I have two small children at home. One of them is in daycare. They get sick often. They make me sick sometimes. If I'm sick, I'm not going to come to class. I will either arrange for the class meeting to take place on Zoom, which is not ideal. I don't really want to do that. Or I will arrange for someone else to cover the class, or I will just cancel the class in the very worst case. If I'm sick, I'm not going to come to class. I'm recording these lectures. The lectures that are, are going to be happening in class will be made available to you after the fact. So if you don't come to class, you're not really going to be missing any material because you'll have the ability to, to watch it after the fact. If you don't come to class, you're going to miss out on some time with your team. But again, they will understand. They will absolutely understand if you're not able to come to class because you are sick. 
All right, so teams, the teams that I'm telling you about who are very understanding people who will definitely understand if you are not able to come to class because you are sick. You are all sitting with, with your teams. I'm gonna give you some time now. One of our goals is that you need to, I want you to be able to work on a team effectively. So I'd like you to start working on your team with stuff. I'd like you all to introduce yourselves to one another. So please tell your team what your name is and what your preferred pronoun is. I'd like you to take this opportunity to share contact information with your team. So either email addresses or gosh, I don't know what you kids are using these days to talk to each other, Discord or Telegram or whatever. Share some kind of contact information. After today's class, I'm going to just send you all an email with your email addresses so that you all have each other's email addresses within your team. But it's nice to be able to share contact information, especially if you don't want to be emailing each other all the time. I'd like you to come up with a team name. This is entirely up to you to decide what you want to call yourselves. Please come up with a team name. The only rule here is that everyone on your team has to agree what the team name is that you're coming up with. And after you've come up with a team name, I'd like you to write it down on that team, whatever team number paper that I put down on the table and then give it to me after class so that I know what all of your team names are. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to do this, to introduce yourselves to each other, share contact information, come up with a team name, and, uh, and uh, say hello to each other. So please go ahead. <laughs> All right, so um, please take the time to write down your team name and then at the end of class, please bring those papers back up to me. So just nominate someone to bring it up to me. Uh, the team names, they're not final. Like if you, if you don't like the team name that you picked after the fact, don't, don't worry about it. Just let me know and I'll change it in my records. Uh, it's not a permanent thing. Just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, uh, the team sizes this term, they're teams of five people. So if there are fewer than five people in your group right now, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm gonna send you all contact information for the team that you've been assigned to. So email addresses either later today or tomorrow. If there aren't five people here, it's your job to contact those people that are not here right now. Um, in some cases, if, if it's a very few number of people that are present and uh, the rest of the team is just ghosting you, then I'll make changes. If there's like four people here and one person is ghosting you, I, I probably won't make changes to the team. Um, but uh, yeah, if somebody is ghosting you, you can't get a hold of them, just please take the time to let me know. Uh, please let me know what's going on so that I can try and get in touch with them to, uh, to find out what's happening. All right, so now that you know each other a little bit better, I'd like you to spend some time actually doing something related to this class. So coming up with a team name is great. It's a good team building activity and it gets you an opportunity to know each other a little bit better, but it's not really related to software engineering. So, I would like you to tell me what you think software engineering is. You probably heard a little bit about this in Comp 2150. You probably heard a little bit about this in Comp 2150. If you're a co-op student, maybe you've done some of this stuff already in a co-op work term. I'd like us to go through this process of figuring out what software engineering is. And the way that I'd like us to do this is, uh, is to build a word cloud. So I'm gonna give you some time, just talk among your team first. And then once you've got a sense of what words you wanna put into this word cloud, then start building it. I'm gonna give you about five minutes to do this activity. So not quite as much time as coming up with a team name and introducing yourselves, sharing contact information, but please talk. One person per team should be entering stuff for you. So have just one person nominated to do it and, uh, and please go ahead. All right, okay, so let's take a look at this. 
these are a lot of great words. These are a lot of great words. So I, I see the big words here are uh, problem solving, modularity, process, design. I also like to see things like do not piss off your team. Uh, and Rashid, I see Rashid's name. <laughs> process, process is a big thing. Yes, absolutely. Process is a big thing in software engineering. We're going to be talking about t today and then maybe on Thursday a little bit about some of the kinds of processes that are used. So how do groups of people go about organizing themselves to have a goal of building some big project? What steps do they take to go through starting from some idea and producing software at the end? Process is a big part of this. Related to process are things like communication. Communication is something that you're going to have to do a lot. Communication is, uh, it's a bit of a meat space problem. It's less about writing code and it's a lot more about how we communicate and how we share ideas with each other and how we share ideas with our clients, the people that we're building software for. Modularity and design. These two things in my mind go together. They go together. Modularity and design are two things where we're trying to not just have software. I don't know. Did any of you ever play Katamari Damashi before? Do you know what that is? I spelled it wrong. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll play this intro. This is not explaining anything. Okay, let me make sure that it actually shows gameplay. Because that's the important part here. It doesn't show gameplay. Does it? Uh, let's we'll watch it. Wait a minute. I forget what this character's name is. Like the king of all things, something, something, something. No, it doesn't. It doesn't show gameplay. This is a terrible disaster. All right, full gameplay walkthrough. That'll work. It's three hours long. Let's watch this. Okay, here is Katamari Damashi. Okay, I finally found something good. Software for us up until, up until today. We're gonna stop doing this. This is software development for us. Let's just roll around and collect stuff until we're a big enough sphere, and then I, I, don't, I don't remember what the goal of this game is. We just kind of collect a bunch of stuff. You're literally just this little character that's rolling a ball around that's collecting a bunch of random garbage that happens to be in your environment. And uh, you can see up in the corner here that the, the sphere right now is 41 centimeters in diameter. Software development for us, I'll, I'll let you watch the rest of that in your own time. Software development for us is about design now. We want to spend the time to make conscious decisions about how to build our software before we start building our software. That's related to modularity in the sense that if we spend time making conscious decisions about how to build our software before we do it, it should be easier to take things and make them into modules, separate responsibilities for things into different places, 
so that we don't have this big sphere of just different pieces of software all intermingled together. Prototype, design software, app development, not hardware. There's definitely not really a hardware course. Build software, building software. Yes, we're definitely going to build software. That is a major deliverable, and that is a major part of software engineering. That's, that's why you're all here. You want to be able to build software. You want to get a job. You want to get a job. You want to help make money. You want to get a job. You want to get a job building software, and we want to help you be able to build software. Software engineering to me, so this was up there, the software development life cycle. A major part of software engineering for us is taking a look at this idea of what the software development life cycle is. We're going to look at it this week and probably not really talk much about it later in the course, but you're going to be making observations about the software development life cycle as you're going through the motions of building this large software project. Software engineering is gathering requirements. Up until this point, maybe you've taken 3020 and you've done a little bit of this already, HCI, maybe you've taken that already and you've done some requirements gathering, but if you haven't, up until this point, building software has been for you. You have been building software for yourself. Yeah, somebody else told you what to build. They gave you a detailed assignment description, but the software that you've been building has been exclusively for you and the grader to use. Requirements gathering is a major part of software engineering and a major part of our software development life cycle where we go around actually asking, what are we building and what does it need to do? Designing software, so taking the time to make conscious decisions about what we're going to build before we start building it so that we can make sure that things are going to fit together and be easy to extend later. Testing, making sure that our software does what it says it's supposed to do. Doing so in automated fashions, writing code to run and evaluate other code and just actually running it ourselves manually. Maintaining existing software. So you're going to be building up a large project. Software engineering is making sure that the code that you have built in the past continues to work and making sure that the code that you've built in the past is able to be added to as its lifespan goes on. Planning, taking the time to not just plan out what our software is going to look like in terms of design, but planning in terms of when are we going to do stuff. So like literally on a calendar, when am I going to build different parts of this? and assigning responsibility to different people of who is going to build this part of the application. Working together on a team. A lot of the projects that you've built so far are small enough that you can build them by yourself, but now we're thinking about something that's a little bit bigger and working on a team. This is a major part of software, en software engineering. Interacting with people. The people that you've interacted with before are people like TAs and maybe your peers. You're spending a lot of time talking to your peers about what the assignment is asking you to do. A major part of software engineering is actually interacting with clients and actually interacting with other people on your team to, to produce something. Communication is the major part of that. Communication is a major part of all of these things and interacting with people, interacting with your team, interacting with your clients and building and designing and planning. Programming is part of this. Absolutely programming is part of this. You can't build software without programming. People have tried to make things that can help people build software without programming and it, uh, it works okay, but it's not great. Programming is definitely a part of software engineering. It's kind of the smaller part of the focus that we have when we're thinking about software engineering in this course. The major things that we're gonna be looking at at the beginning anyway are going to be about planning and, and communication. 
All right, so how did you get here? How, how did you all get here? The bus? I, I came down the stairs from my office and down the hallway. You've been here for a while. You, you, you've been at university for a while. When you started building software, maybe you were in high school when you started building software, but maybe you were actually writing your first lines of code for the first time in Comp 1010 or Comp 1012. How, how many people here took Comp 1012 out of curiosity? And were you all planning to be engineers? Good, I'm glad I, we convinced you to come and do computer science. Wait, are you an engineer still? Oh, well that's okay. The software, like it, it, was, it seemed crazy hard at the time. Building software in Comp 1010 seemed really, really hard. Building software in Comp 1012 seemed really, really hard because it was this idea of taking an idea and encoding that as explicit instructions for what our computer should do. How many of you remember writing your first loop? Nobody does? You've all forgotten already? Everybody, everybody put your hand up. Everybody remembers. Actually, no, I don't remember writing my first loop. But we all wrote this. We definitely all wrote this. We typed these magic words in, and our computer spit out the words hello world at us. Eventually, once we got through 10.10 or 10.12, we got to 10.20, and we spent some time building more software. It got bigger, but we were feeling more comfortable with our programming language. We spent time learning about objects and classes. We spent time learning about exceptions and how to handle exceptions. And we spent time learning about reading and writing files. And we got feeling like, hey, I'm pretty good at this. I, I got programming. I get it. I really understand programming. And I think I'm going to keep going with this. And then you started writing code in C. And then you started writing code in C, and you saw uh, these words a lot, segmentation fault. And uh, then you maybe started to wonder if this was the right choice. The kinds of software that you were building in Comp 1020 and the kinds of software that you're building in Comp 2160 are comparable. If you reflect on it, if you take the time to think about the assignments that you were building in Comp 2160, they were approximately the same types of problems that you saw in Comp 1020. Dealing with files, dealing with exceptional code, doing a little bit of testing. So there was some new stuff designed by contract. But ultimately, you were, you were building linked lists. You were build, building linked lists. You were working with arrays. You weren't doing anything that was crazy conceptually diff different from what you did in Comp 1020. Once you emerged from Comp 2160, then you started thinking about doing a little bit more software design. At this point, yes, you, you, you kind of have programming in the bag at this point. You, you got it. You all have a lot to learn. I feel like I still have a lot to learn in terms of software and coding and building programs. But by the time you're in Comp 2150 and starting to think about how to do object-oriented programming and designing software, building hierarchies of classes using different programming languages, you've got most of the concepts related to programming at this point. At this point in Comp 2150, you started to think about, maybe you started to think about some of the kinds of things that go into software design, like design patterns. We're gonna spend more time later in the course thinking about design patterns, but Comp 2150 would have given you an introduction to this. Overall though, the assignments that you had in these classes were they were small. I'm, I'm going to put scare quotes around this. They were small assignments. 
they seemed huge at the time, but I guarantee that if you look back at a 1010 assignment or a 1020 assignment, you're gonna think like, I can't believe that took me 20 hours to do this. The assignments that you had in those courses took you two to four weeks to do. They didn't take very much time, or at least you weren't given very much time to do them. You could do it by yourself. In COP 2150, you were getting to the point of, wow, maybe this is a lot for one person to do, but you could do the whole assignment by yourself. You didn't need any help to do that, hopefully. When you finished your assignment, you never thought about it again until I started telling you to think about Comp 2160 and then I could see people shudder and you never thought about it again. Does anybody still have a Comp 2160 folder? Do you have Comp 2160 folder? Do you have your C program still? Okay, I, I don't. I mean, I, I don't have them from when I wrote them, but I have them from when I taught the course. But you never thought about it again. You don't have to think about an assignment. You basically write this code, you chuck it over the wall at the grader, and then you get a grade back. And you never think about that software again. Real world projects, they're not like that. Real world software development is not like that. When you get out into industry and when you start building software for people, real world projects are not anything like that. The biggest change that you're going to see with software in the real world is that they are immense in size. When you do look back at your Comp 2160 assignments, when you look back at Comp 2150 and 1020, you're going to see that you've got maybe a couple hundred lines of code. Maybe a couple hundred lines of code. I'd say like 500 at the most per assignment that you wrote. Real world software projects are really big. The Linux kernel, and this is dated, uh, the Linux kernel 4.13 came out several years ago. The Linux kernel is 24 million lines of code. It's, it's 24 mil million, with an M, million lines of code. It was developed by more than 15,000 people. And this is an open source software project, so its scale is a little different than some of the other things that we might be thinking about. And they have developed it across 1,500 different companies. So Comp 2150 is like 500 lines of code. This software project that's been around for 30 years is 24 million lines of code. Google, at least as of about seven years ago, had more than two billion lines of source code for all of their projects. So don't get me wrong, it's not like just the Google search engine is two billion lines of code, but all of their products about seven or eight years ago were two billion lines of code. Real world projects are immense in size in terms of what you're actually building. To build software like this, it, it kind of has to be organized. You have to spend some time thinking about what it is that you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And part of that is that you need to do some planning before you actually begin writing software. The software that you build when you get to scales up like this, it needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to change. You need to be able to change the code and the program that you've written to be able to add new features, to be able to fix things, to be able to change the things that you have built before. When you're building software, it often grows fairly organically. And this is true of large projects and the small assignments that you've been doing before. You start really small and you kind of build on that. You're still going to do that. That strategy that you have been using, start small. I'm going to build my main method, public static void main string args. I'm going to build my main function, void main void, void main void. I'm going to build my main function. And then I'm going to build more after that. You're still going to do that in this course, and you're still going to do that with bigger projects, but you kind of have to do this in a uh, uh, kind of a planned way. Organic usually becomes this, or it becomes this. Yeah.
Organic usually becomes this, where you just collect a bunch of stuff over time, as opposed to building something with purpose. Software development follows a life cycle. When we're building software, when we're building projects, it follows this idea of a life cycle. The life cycle of a project consists of several different phases. The first one is analysis and requirements, where you're spending time thinking about the problem that you're being given, making sure that you understand what the problem is, and getting everything that you think you need for the problem, for the project, to be able to build the thing that you're trying to build. The next phase of this life cycle is the design phase, going through the process of taking this problem, you've analyzed it, you've thought about what things you need to build for this, you've asked the person or the people that you're building it for what they want. Now you have this grand idea of what you want to build, now it's taking the time to design a system that you can implement. So not whipping out your laptop and coding, but spending the time to just think about how this is all going to fit together. What pieces am I going to need to build and how do those pieces work together? Once you've spent time doing that design and coming up with this plan for what you want to do, then you go through the process of implementing it. So writing code to satisfy the design that you've come up with. Once you've implemented it, the next phase then is testing and verifying that the code that you've written actually does what the design said it was going to do and it does what it's the analysis and the requirements wanted it to do. So going through the process of figuring out what you're trying to build, figuring out how you're going to build it, building it, and then making sure that you built is what you said you were going to build. After that, you, you give it to the people who want it, and then you have to maintain it. So going through this process of making sure that there are bugs that are fixed when you deliver it to that person, and if they want changes to be made to it, you're going to make changes to it. This is a life cycle. So this is something that kind of goes on and on and on in a circular way. We start with this analysis and requirements. We do design, implement, test, maintain. Get new requirements, design, implement, test, maintain. This is the general set of phases of this idea of the software development life cycle. Waterfall is a process. It's a software development methodology. It is a process that can be used to implement software. The waterfall process is the rigid sequential application of the software development life cycle. Waterfall has different teams of people going through each of these phases of the software development life cycle and completing that phase before passing it off to another team. So what that means is, in practice, the idea of waterfall is that team one would do analysis and requirements gathering. They would talk to the clients, they would get all of the requirements that are needed for this project and then once they have done that to the satisfaction of the clients, team one would take those requirements, they put them in a giant three ring binder, and they would pass that off to team two. Team one would then go on to find another client, or they would be assigned another client and they would start that same process again. Team two would now start to go through the process of designing it. This is our group of software architects. They would go through the process of saying, here's how it should be built. This is what you need to build. Maybe going as far as saying, these are all the classes that need to be built to satisfy this problem. Once they are done with that, they will pass it off to team three here. Team three is our group of coders. They will develop and implement that design. At the same time, our analysis team has passed off their binder to the design team. The design team starts building some, designing something else. The analysis team moves on to another client. 
The implementation team starts building. They go through this process of building the software. They finished, great. Now they pass it off to team four. Team four's job is to test everything. Everyone else that comes before them in this workflow kind of just shifts things down. We've got different teams that are done, different phases of this life cycle that are done by a different team to completion. They finish that thing and they pass it off to the next team. Here's the waterfall model visualized. This is what it looks like. The requirements gathering team produces a document that says this is what our software is. They pass it off. The design team builds an architecture and documents it. They pass it off. The implementation team builds the software and they pass it off for verification. And then finally, there's a team that does maintenance. It's really hard to see the, uh, the arrows here. I apologize for that. But these arrows go this way. They start here and they move to the next one. They point one way. I'd like you to take some time to think about this with your team fairly quickly. I'm going to give you two minutes to think about this with your team and talk about it. Given what I've just described to you, what kind of limitations do you think this has? And I'd like you to also spend some time thinking about what kind of project you think might actually succeed with this kind of a process. I'm going to put this back up so that you can see what waterfall looks like. Just really quickly think about what are the limitations of this and what kinds of software could be built with that. Yeah. All right, so I'm just going to ask you to just keep this right now. Just keep it in your heads, keep it in your notes, keep it to yourselves. We're going to revisit this next class. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because what I want to do is I'd like you to spend some time uh, planning ahead. We are going to start working your projects next class. And to do that, you are going to have to come up with some idea of what you want your project to, to be, what you want to build in the end. There's two things that you can do right now with the time that you've got. One is answer these questions. So look at your phones. Everybody look at your phone and just see what kind of apps you actually have installed. What's common among everybody? What do you all know that's the same? What kinds of things don't you have, but you think would be good to have? What ideas do you have? The other option that you have is to go to the course webpage and go to the content section. And there's a section in here called project. And there's a description of what the project is. Within the project description, there's sample topics that you can pick for what your project is. So if you can't come up with something based on what's on your phones right now, you can take a look at this list of ideas and get something from here. Or you can just come up with something entirely different. It's kind of up to you to decide what you want to build. My advice to you would to be to build something that you want. Motivate yourself, build something that you want. I realize that's not always possible, but build something that you want and that will help motivate you and your team to build something. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do that. You don't have to come to a decision right now, but next class, we are going to start making some non-technical planning artifacts. Having an idea of what you are going to build will help you do that. So please go ahead. I'm going to give you uh, maybe three minutes to do that, and then I'll have a quick summary and we'll end class. All right, so uh, like I said, you, you don't have to come to a decision right now, and you don't even really have to settle on something by next class, but having at least an idea of what you want to build will help make the activities that we do in Thursday's class flow a little bit better. With that in mind, uh, there is some required reading that I have for you to do before you come back to next class. Required readings for this course are always going to be in the course schedule in ROAS, and that will be updated on a weekly basis with either readings or videos for you to watch. 
Uh, if you take a look at my lecture section here, I've put a link directly to week one, so you can just click on that. There are three things for you to read here. The Agile Manifesto itself is, it's literally four sentences long. So this is not a huge thing that I'm asking you to read. The user stories, both of those are a little bit longer, but they're not onerous. This shouldn't take you more than 20 or so minutes to read. My main goal for you to do reading before class is that I don't want to have to be a glossary with slides at the front of the room. I don't want to have to tell you the words that are used to describe these things. I just want to be able to start using these words when I'm uh, giving you examples of what we're doing. So with that, uh, thank you for coming out and I will see you on Thursday. You should expect an email from me probably tomorrow with contact information from your team. Bye everybody.